Our next speaker is Professor Michael Mickey Lustig, an associate professor in our department. He joined the faculty in spring of 2010. He's got a bachelor's degree from Technion, Israel Institute of Technology in 2002, master's degree and PhD degrees in electrical engineering from Stanford, which I won't hold against him since I do as well. <laughs> And uh, in 2004 and 2008, respectively, his research focuses on computational imaging methods in medical imaging, particularly magnetic resonance imaging, MRI. Mickey's a fellow of the Society of Magnetic Resonance in Medicine. His talk today is on mitigating the problems of pediatric MRI with tailored hardware and massive scale computational imaging. Please welcome Professor Lustig. Thanks. <clears throat> All right. Um, thank you all for coming today. Really appreciate it. There's this moisture that's coming out from the sky, which is a really unusual in the Bay Area. So really, uh, really appreciate you coming here. Today I'm going to talk about something I'm very passionate about. I've been working on for almost a decade. And so you'll see a lot of work that's been done by many, many people, um, but with, uh, with, with, with success. So uh, I'm going to talk about MRI. And uh, it's very often confused, MRI, with uh, CT. It's probably some of you have gone through MRI, some of you have gone CT. But even if though you're a technologist you know, from the Silicon Valley, you sometimes get confused because nobody has actually pointed an eyebrow here. That this is actually an MRI, <laughs> and this is a CT. They, they, while they look similar, they're very, very, very different in the way that they're actually using physics. So um, CT is x-ray based, it has rapidly moving parts, it uses ionizing radiation, it's really less sensitive to soft tissue but super easy to operate. While MRI is based on magnetic fields, uh, no moving parts, no ionizing radiation whatsoever, sensitive, extremely sensitive to soft tissue and various forms of contrast. And it's super complicated to operate as opposed to CT. Um, now, this is, oh, I don't have sound. That's unfortunate, but that's OK. I would have wanted to wake you up. Oh, there you go. Thank you. So this is the sound of MRI. And MRI data is actually encoded. The raw data that we get is something on the left. And we need to apply a Fourier transform, some transformation, in order to reconstruct images. Uh, and the data is acquired sequentially. Uh, one after, uh, after the other, in order to form an image, we need to collect data for a long time by repeating an experiment over and over again. And once we have enough data, we can reconstruct an image. So this is why MRI takes a long time to recover. Uh, now, what's amazing about MRI is that you have all these knobs in what's called a pulse sequence in the firmware, with how we drive the, uh, the magnetic fields in the system, that can create all this various amazing contrast uh, of imagery. So what you see on the left, just changing sequence parameters in software, you can get completely different looking images. This is what's so amazing, but also why research has been going on in the field for a long time. So this is just an exemplary images of MRI. You can see just extreme diverse, uh, diversity of, of type of contrast from structural to diffusion of water, from functional, and so on and so forth. So I would put kind of a separate line here. This part is the structural application of MRI. And this is the functional part. So MRI has a lot of function as well uh, to be associated with it. Now, a little bit about what my group uh, or the, the computational MRI research group at Berkeley uh, is involved with is pretty much the marriage between this amazing, amazing device in physics and a computer and a computation. So we leverage both the kind of imaging, physics, you know, what's, what's behind, you know, how it actually works. We use a lot of prior knowledge, so learning and uh, modeling. We modify the way data is being acquired. We also design hardware to make it all better. We put it all together and we leverage computation or produce this amazing imagery that you see here in order to capture more contrast, more dynamics, and, and get more diagnostic imagery. Um, so this is really a multidisciplinary area. It covers both sides of EECS, but also other, um, um, other disciplines. Now, let me talk about uh, pediatric body MRI. MRI is really excellent for diagnostic pediatric, uh, pediatric disease. 
I mean, it has excellent, excellent uh, contrast. But the problem is there's huge challenges when imaging pediatric patients. You know, children cannot keep still. They don't understand the notion of breath hold. They have really low tolerance for, uh, for long exam and super wide number of indication. And so what, as a result, what happens is that they either refer to CT, which has uh, associated radiation, uh, an increased risk for a patient, or just put uh, under anesthesia, which also has associated risk. Uh, with it. Can you put the audio? Yeah. <laughs> I still need the audio, if you don't mind. It's more, more of that. OK, so now I'm going to show you, uh, pay attention, I'm going to show you a CT scan. OK, ready? Let's start. And then, done. OK, done. What really frustrates me as an MRI scientist is just CT is so fast and robust. And it's just super easy. Super easy. But the problem is with pediatric patients are much more susceptible to the adverse effects of radiation and uh, the risk of cancer. And they have to actually go through many, many uh, scans during their lives, which also uh, increase the risk more significantly than that. Uh, and unfortunately, the contrast is much, much poorer. So we would like to avoid going through CT. So we'd like to do MRI. But MRI often uses anesthesia in order to image pediatric patient. And there's different levels of, sed uh, of sedation from kind of just mild sedation to deep anesthesia. But if you want to really mitigate with uh, anxiety and motion, then uh, deep, uh, deep anesthesia to, uh, to general anesthesia is often used. But sedation really has uh, found out to be, have short and long-term term risk for, uh, for pediatric patients. There's side effects and complications from putting them under anesthesia. But also, uh, research have found that there's um, long-term effects like uh, learning disabilities and things like that that uh, occur over time. Now, beyond that, there's really huge operational costs for going through anesthesia. You know, uh, visits are much longer. The, it's way more expensive from staffing point of view. It's super hard to schedule and results in really poor utilization of the scanner. Um, but really, um, the problem is that you can only do it in certain centers. And so that limits the availability of MRI, this amazing imaging modality uh, for pediatric patients. Ooh. Now I skip. OK. Uh, there you go. Now, um, to uh, avoid anesthesia, really, preparation uh, is the key. So, you know, we've been, you know, there's regular ways that you can try to, to mitigate with this. So, for example, just prepare the child. So, I had a seven year old child that was supposed to go through uh, an MRI, and the, uh, the doctor really insisted. She told me, oh, no, she'll have to go through anesthesia. But, you know, she was born into MRI from like age zero. This is her drawing at, at age five. And so, you know, she just went through it like a champ, no problem, for a whole hour. So preparation is really a key. Um, now, if you want to deal with other type of patients, so, um, you know, for smaller patients, you can leverage natural sleep cycle or a bundle feed. But with older patients, uh, you can use, uh, you know, distraction and entertainment. But the main issue is this, like, one to five-year-old patients, which, to be honest, I mean, they, they can really not go, uh, they, they don't understand uh, pretty much, you, can, you can't really get them to sleep whenever you want, but also you can't get them to, uh, to not to move, as most of you parents um, uh, uh, know. So that's, that's really the critical issue. And there, imaging is the key. So what we'd like to do is to image as fast as poss possible, be able to be robust to motion, and be able maybe to correct for, uh, for it, and to minimize the entire scan time by minimizing the amount of protocols uh, that you're going to be using. So um, in order to mitigate with the imaging part, we started uh, this, this project almost a decade ago um, that aimed to develop these uh, technologies to, uh, to do fast imaging for, uh, for pediatric patient. And this is the team. Uh, that was about 10 years ago. It's a collaboration between GE Healthcare, UC Berkeley, and uh, Stanford University. And um, you know, what's cool about it is like about eight years ago, Kurt Koitzer, who's here, uh, gave a talk here as where I'm speaking in the Bear Seminar and was talking about how, uh, he was talking about the landscape of parallel computing, but how uh, domain experts like myself can leverage parallel computing uh, and so on and so forth. And you'll see a lot of that in, the, in this talk. So, 
what's interesting is that as time goes by, you know, some people left and some people were added. Uh, but you know, it's just amazing to me how many people kind of contributed uh, to this particular project. Um, which the aim of it is to do an anesthesia-free, robust pediatric uh, body MRI, and it's funded by, by the NIH. And today, I'm going to talk primarily about the work that's been done at, at UC Berkeley by UC Berkeley students, but also with collaboration with the other institutions. So here's, here's the problem. <laughs> Scanners are just not meant for children. They're just designed for adults and then adapted to, uh, to pediatric patients. So um, it's just secondary adaptation. So the environment, if, if you walked into an MRI environment, you know, this is not child friendly. The hardware, the, the way that it's designed inside, you know, the size of the bore, the size of the, the gradients, the coils that are put on the patient, the sequences, the protocols, all of these are just not designed for kids. They're just adapted. So we're kind of Something like this. So yeah, it works. You can get covered, but it's really not, uh, not a fit. Let's talk about one thing that, I'm, uh, that is important is the coils. Coils are these, these antennas that you put on the body in order to receive the MRI signal. And really, the key is proximity. If you get close to the, as close as possible to the patient, then you get much, much better signal-to-noise ratio. You get signal-to-noise ratio. You get better image quality, both resolution, and you can reduce scan time. So um, when we use MRI, we use these arrays of coils, arrays of antennas that we put on the patient. Uh, and the array density and coverage are, and fit are really key to get better image quality. Now, the problem is that often adult coils are being used on pediatric patients. So you've got this like, you know, cute kid here lying around. And then uh, you add all this tubing and wiring to measure you know, all sorts of stuff. And that's great. And then you're going to go and stick on it this like, really heavy, lumpy coil on top that actually can disturb even uh, their ability to breathe. So you have to put some padding in order to kind of elevate and so on and so forth. So this is really not working. Now, if you look actually at the number of elements, so this is a 16-channel uh, array, so, you know, state of the art. But if you look at the size of the child, really only six channels are seen by uh, by, uh, by the array, and so it's really not effective in terms of signal-to-noise ratio, acceleration, scan, and so on and so forth. Okay, so that limits SNR, it limits uh, your ability to accelerate, and also limits patient management. I mean, can you, can you see what this kid is even doing? So we had this dream, and the dream was kind of something like this. What is the most fitting thing that we can think of as kind of clothing? Can we design coils that are as comfortable and fitting as, uh, as clothing on a child. And so uh, about five, six years ago, we started this project. This is a collaboration with my colleague, Ana Claudia Arias, and uh, a bunch of uh, colleague, uh, graduate students, also postdoc. And the idea was to try to develop flexible, um, uh, flexible arrays that can be used in MRI. Now, Ana is, a, is an expert in printed electronics, and so this really uh, was a perfect uh, a perfect uh, coupling over here at Berkeley. And so the process was we developed is using screen printing, like uh, much like you print t uh, you know, on t-shirts. And um, the idea there is that you, uh, you have a certain pattern that you like to print, and then you, um, you use silver ink that you deposit on top of very, very flexible substrate and be able to uh, automatically generate these uh, amazing um, uh, coils. So these are these uh, antenna elements onto these much nicer uh, substrates that can be used effectively like clothing. This is uh, our first 12-channel uh, pediatric array. I mean, it's gorgeous. It has printed antennas. I mean, it really fits for child. Um, it really has this unique packaging that makes it extremely flexible, safe, and comfortable. It weighs almost nothing, and, um, and it, it can be used on, uh, on patients. And this is, uh, this is kind of an example of the use of this uh, particular 12-channel array at uh, Lucille Packard uh, Children's Hospital at Stanford. And what you can see here, first of all, is just 
beautiful image quality, both from three, uh, all the way from three months year old through two and five year old. So this is just exemplary images. But also you can see kind of the placement on a two year old. So it's very different than the pictures that I showed you before. But what, one thing I want to point out, there's these respiratory bellows that you put on, uh, on top of the patient in order to sense the respiratory, like the, their breathing. Usually they're underneath the coil, but because the coil is so soft, you can just put them on top of it. No problem and still uh, be able to measure the breathing. The top image actually has a cross section. You can kind of see the, this bellow signal coming out from the plastic. Um, and you know where the coil is? This is where it is. Okay, so it's like extremely thin, close, and provides you then uh, the best signal to noise ratio. We did a study uh, with 20 patients on usability and preference, both clinicians uh, and uh, anesthesiologists and parents. And what we found is that it's really preferred by the tech nurses and parents and child. And it's clinically diagnostic with SNR that's similar to a 32 channel array that was really the one that's very, very heavy. And this, this will be published in the journal of radiology. Now, because we were excited about this technology, we went ahead and actually started uh, a company. Uh, this is all kind of uh, motivated. You know, Berkeley has, a, uh, has been uh, promoting the, tra the, the translation of the technology into, uh, into uh, the industry using this uh, mechanism like the Baker Fellow, uh, which both Anna and I uh, are a part of. And so we, we founded this company. Uh, we uh, were... We leveraged this Baker Fellow, we used Skydeck, we got UCSF Pediatric Device Consortium and also NSF funding, and now we just uh, finished our, uh, our seed round. And we're very excited to take this technology and be able now to, uh, to actually take it uh, into, um, into practice. Now the research in this, uh, in this area is still ongoing. Um, really what we think of, of arrays and antennas is kind of the future is really just digital design with additive manufacturing. Now if you want to make something that's really fit, you know, flexibility is one way, but it doesn't have to be because you can, if you can design something that's rigid but it's actually conformable or exactly fitting to the patient. And this is the work of uh, Karthik uh, Gopalan, one of our graduate students, where he uses, you know, screen, uh, uh, um, uh, still screen printing onto a, a, a 2D substrate, but then using uh, thermoforming in order to map it into 3D to a shape that fits exactly uh, the, the size of a patient. And of course, you can do all this modeling and pre-compensate for all, all those distortions. So this is really exciting work. Uh, the other way of doing things is printing 3D and then go ahead and be able to manufacture onto this 3D substrate. And this is an example of another uh, graduate student, Ala, uh, uh, Ala who's, who's doing uh, this work. And this is an example of a carotid coil that we, uh, we develop on top of a carbon 3D type of prints, which are very, very smooth, so we can uh, print directly on these, uh, on these structures. OK. So let's, let's move on for the imaging part. Um, now, coils, when they're close, give you more signal-to-noise ratio. So you can think of it more uh, as having more photons, you know, like just more signal. And when you have more signal, you can means that you can image faster, uh, you get better high quality, you get more resolution, less noise, and so on and so forth. But let me argue that MRI is similar to what early cameras used to be. It's slow. Okay, it's slow. Now, this is an early camera, uh, camera image uh, from 1838. And you can see kind of a nice street over there. And something is missing. You know what's missing? Because if you actually, first of all, there's no people. But this is kind of what you're supposed to see in the street. But you don't see it. You don't see it because the exposure time for this image was at the order of an hour. And so everything just got completely blurred out. The only thing that you can actually see, let me actually zoom in here, there's actually some people there. There's one person, and that one person is a guy that's getting his shoe shined, and he was standing still for enough time to be able to still see uh, uh, its silhouette. So this is kind of where MRI is. There's lots of stuff going on, but we get these images, but we're missing a lot of fundamental stuff, okay? So we want to be able to image this dynamic, this, this amazing dynamic that happens in the body, but MRI is just too slow. 
So this idea of what's called, uh, uh, so, so this is kind of what we're, we're doing. We're, if you think about it, we're collecting data. We're collecting data over some time. And then once we're finished with collecting data, we can reconstruct an image. And if things have changed during that time, well, this is, you know, we kind of get the average of that or some artifacts and so on and so forth. So here's the idea of what's called compressed sensing. So if we know that if we uh, collect data, we can, you know, we can represent using some number of, of, of bytes, then we reconstruct an image and so on and so forth. But we know that we can take images and compress them. Like we do this all the time with digital cameras, right? We, we take a uh, large number of pixels and then JPEG compress them, JPEG 2000, to just smaller size. So this notion, there's a lot of redundancy in the, these images. So the idea of compressed sensing is actually to capture less data in somewhat of a randomized way illustrated here. And because we know that those images are compressible, we can leverage this prior knowledge and take this compressed information that we made from just a subset of data and be able to reconstruct those images. Okay? So there's a lot of mathematical theory that have been developed in the last 10 years or so that allows you to do this, um, and uh, it's called compressed sensing. Now, once you can do this, well, then you can think of, oh, well, we just continuously acquire data and use these subsets in order to reconstruct dynamics. Or maybe uh, we can get uh, something else. Maybe we can get some extra parameters because now we, we have this redundancy we can exploit. And maybe we can capture maybe flow in the heart or other things like, like that. So we can leverage these ideas. This, this all comes from the fact that there is low dimensionality in natural data. Natural data is really of low dimension. For example, we can leverage what ideas are called sparsity. So for example, you take this brain image and you can compute what's called a wavelet transform and have a sparser representation that means that it's, more, it's redundant. I mean, it lives in a smaller dimensional space. You can use ideas like low rankness, uh, you know, correlations within the data that you can use to compress. But even you can also now use learn models. So data, completely data-driven model that uh, this is what I call where machine learning and, uh, and AI meets compressed sensing together. So we can leverage those in order to get even a better one. So here's one example of a work in my group done by Frank Ong, who's uh, just uh, recently graduated. And I'm just showing you a non-medical image, image because probably you're not used to, but Frank, during his PhD, developed these models to look at uh, re low dimensional representation of, of dynamic images. And so what he did really is kind of be able to decompose these videos into different dynamic scales. For example, you can take this video and you know, decompose it into the static part, a coarse scale dynamics, and then finer, and then a finer scale, and be able to capture the motion part and remove the non-motion part, and so on and so forth. Um, these ideas can, of course, can be done when you look at contrast-enhanced MRI, when you inject contrast to the patient, and we'd like to see this contrast flowing through the body this can again be decomposed into these lower dimensional space, for example, by looking at, at those typical decomposition. Once you have these decomposition, you can leverage this in what's called the reconstruction from less data. So if we start capturing data and we don't have enough, we can use these models in order to enforce this prior information. This is data-driven models that allow you to take this under sample data and using very efficient, distributed, parallel implementation that enforce this low dimensionality being consistent with the data using massive scale computing, you can try to go and impose it and slowly and iteratively go and reconstruct this dynamic information from this uh, uh, low dimensional data. So here's an example of reconstructing about hundreds of gigabyte of images, videos, this is 3D videos from just two gigabyte of, of, of raw data. And I'm talking about matrix sizes that are unusual. So, you know, 400 by 300 by 200 by 500. Just, just do these multiplication in your head. You see it's, it's quite large. This is not just a regular video that we're talking about. This is three-dimensional. Now, this is what Frank was able to present uh, in his uh, dissertation defense. I mean, you just stare at this, and I, I could not believe looking at this, right? So this is a contrast-enhanced dynamic MRI of a pediatric patient. This is almost his entire body. You can see the respiratory motion. You can see the contrast enhancement. And it's completely 
three-dimensional, done in free breathing, no gating, nothing whatsoever, using these ideas on uh, this distributed type of reconstruction that uses this uh, low-dimensional model that came from the data. And what you can also see here that this patient, for example, uh, I don't know if you see the lungs, you know, there's accumulation of fluid in the bottom of the lungs. And so that means that there's actually some bleeding that happens there. And so this is very obvious when you have this three-dimensional structure, you can see where it's coming from and so, so forth. There's a lot of information in this type of data sets. I want to give you another example. So typically when you do an MRI exam, I don't know if, how many of you have gone through an MRI exam, but you just go through many, many different scans that give you these, uh, this different type of contrast. So uh, here's an example of a pediatric uh, knee exam that is a typical protocol that's done at Stanford. You go through like you know, one type of contrast, and it's all these 2D scans uh, where you uh, get one type of contrast, and then you kind of change the, uh, the parameters, and you acquire another image, and then you change the parameters, and you acquire another image, and you change the parameter, you acquire another image, different orientation and so on and so forth. And that takes time. It takes time, it's not robust, and it's, 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 it's a real issue. We would like to reduce the, you know, the, the length of these protocols. So what, we, what, what John Tamir, again a graduate student uh, and now a researcher uh, here at Berkeley, has been doing is the, again the notion of being able to, while data has been acquired, you know, tune those parameters kind of mix all those type of information all together and use these, use these ideas of low dimensionality in order to reconstruct all those contrasts in a single scan. That is shorter than the whole exam. Okay? So this is, uh, this is kind of the idea. This idea is, is named T2 shuffling. And again, we're talking about 0.5 gigabyte of data is acquired, but about 11 gigabyte of reconstructed data. It is, but the, here's the issue. We're talking about massive computation. So in order to be clinically feasible, to be used on a scanner in the clinic, you need about two minutes of latency uh, between the scan and when the images show up. And a naive reconstru you know, reconstruction, even parallel one, takes about 3.9 hours in order to do. So it's not really feasible. So here's where computation on MRI appears in a clinic. So here's, here's kind of the idea again. We leverage the physics. We know how kind of the signal decays and changes over time and creates this contrast. So we put that in. We know some prior knowledge about the statistics of, you know, of these type of tissues. We acquire data in six minutes in a randomized way. Um, and then leverage you know, computer cluster with parallel computing uh, uh, algorithm as distributed uh, uh, and so on and so forth in order to be able to reconstruct it within 90 seconds. This is an example of a beautiful collaboration both in, in industry, and this is where I kind of I invite you to, uh, to collaborate with our faculty, because this is an example where we collaborate both GE that actually funded this research and Intel Labs, which helped us with the uh, implementation of these type of reconstruction on their optimized hardware in order to achieve this 90 second uh, uh, reconstruction. Okay, so this is really, really nice, great collaboration. Uh, here's just an example of a radial tear uh, in, the, in the meniscus of this pediatric patient. On the bottom is just typical scans that you get in 2D. On the top is what's called MR shuffling. Um, and what you can see here, I'm point, pointing out the tear in the meniscus, but because we're imaging things in 3D, not in thick slices, you can actually see it better on, on the T2 shuffling. So you get a little bit even better information that you would get uh, from the regular scan. Um, now, in order to do the clinical integration, this is with my great colleague, uh, Professor uh, Shres Vasnawala uh, at the Children's Hospital at Stanford. We integrated into the Stanford Adult and Children's Hospital with over 3,000 patients done so far with this type of a technology. Uh, we did a clinical study to evaluate the diagnostic quality with 94 agreement and in clinical interpretation. Uh, and you can look at the papers about this. But the cool thing is that we created a new, fast, targeted scan. So now if a uh, pediatric patient goes into orthopedic surgeon, they can get um, the specialized targeted exam that uses this technology, which is only 10 minutes. And the idea there is that you can actually do a walk-in exam because it only takes 10 minutes. You can squeeze it within uh, the regular schedule. But it's also a third of the cost of the conventional exam from an insurance point of view. So it's, there's actually reduction in cost because of this uh, short exam. So this is really exciting. Um, Here's just a, a personal story again. We, uh, we, uh, I was at a conference in Switzerland. I took my kids with me. They, uh, this is Noga, my daughter, went skiing, uh, twisted her knee. 
uh, spend most of the week uh, just in bed playing with the computer, um, wheeled uh, across uh, an SFO, you know, speeding us through the lines. And now she's going to get an MRI on Saturday at, uh, at uh, UCSF Benioff Children uh, Hospital at Oakland. Now, they still don't have this targeted pediatric exam, but what they do have is this compressed sensing uh, acquisition, which speeds up still the, uh, the acquisition. So I'm pretty excited to see our technology being used on my daughter, and I hope everything will be fine. <laughs> so the question is, is this working? Um, well, we've been able to reduce uh, anesthesia both in depth, length, and duration. And here's uh, kind of the relative number of cases in Stanford pediatric MRI volume. So the number of anesthesia cases remain the same, but the number of scan have increases. So there is some benefit over there, but still many cases use anesthesia. Now what's missing? What's missing is robustness. It's not fast enough. Uh, recon is not immediate. Sequences are too loud. Scanners are still very manual. Okay, so there's, there's still things to do. So we went from something like this into something that's a little bit better, but slightly awkward, okay? So it's <laughs> still not perfect. So here comes the, kind of the rise of the machine, and, uh, and this is kind of what we're working on and where we want to be. And the machine is not just uh, machine learning. It's, you know, first of all, it's the computation part that we want to work on. Uh, the machine learning, both learning how to acquire data and how to reconstruct data, how to interpret data, how to um, leverage it in the uh, automation and so on and so forth, but also create maybe a pediatric dedicated MRI scanner that is, is small. So here's my list for an ideal pediatric scanner. Uh, child, friendly and small, intelligent, high performance, be able to do motion correction, wireless flexible coils, no wires anymore, cloud heavy compute capable, rapid, silent, comprehensive sequences, and very intelligent modern reconstruction. Um, and with that, I hope that we would, instead of going you know, from misfit to awkward into this gorgeous, you know, perfect fit, into what children really need to wear. And thank you for the funding. We have a lot of funding from many, many sources. And I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. OK, so the sign-up sheet is out of the hallway. Are there any questions in the meantime? Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm off topic, but I'm curious. if. Can you use the, all the technology, all the modeling, to continuously scan me so that I can see the evolution of my body? So could this apply, but not on the nano scale, so I can see in my, my cells? I know that the images are like my knees, but can I narrow it down to the cell level to see what evolves? Uh, there are some limitations with the MRI in general in terms of the resolution. It's a weak. Uh, interaction imaging modality, so it's uh, often S signal to noise ratio starved. So the res typical resolutions that we can get in vivo are about 0.5 millimeter isotropic. Um, so it's very hard to see like microscopy. Although there are ways to observe my, uh, the microscopy level indirectly through imaging diffusion of water and some other indications. So people are looking at the molecular level using MRI. Um, and again, all these things take a long time to do. So all these type of modeling enhance everything from improving the signal to noise ratio, seeing a, the dynamics, um, and so on and so forth. So uh, the answer is probably uh, mixed is yes, but probably not exactly what you're wanting. Okay, thanks again, Mickey, for...